I'm Linda Hirsch. And I'm Jim Carty, and this is EdCast, a program created and produced by educators for everyone interested in education. What is the scarcest resource in education today? According to Rutgers University Professor Richard Miller, the answer is attention. In a time of superabundant information and multiple devices that offer endless distractions, it seems that just learning how to focus is becoming a major problem. Today, Dr. Miller discusses how important and difficult it has become to cultivate curiosity in what he terms these our distracted, polarized, irate, ill-informed times. Later on in the program, I'll speak to some students about how they deal with digital distractions both in the classroom and in their everyday lives. But first, we go to Linda and her guest in the studio. My guest today is Rutgers University professor Richard Miller. Dr. Miller publishes and lectures on literacy, technology, and higher education. His current research focuses on changes in education as a result of our easy access to devices that allow us to instantly share and receive information. He is also the author of Writing at the End of the World. Welcome to EdCast and thank you for joining thank us. Thank you for having me. What is unique about these distracting, polarized, irate times in terms of educating students? I, if you talk to any teacher and pretty much any parent, they'll say to you the hardest thing now about uh, working with children is getting their attention. <coughs> um, the, the proliferation of these technological devices has produced a world where, a world that's responsive to your own desires. You can program what you want, watch what you want, when you want it, and surround yourself with ideas that you find comforting and familiar, where people like it. And so that's produced a, a situation where it's it's difficult to get students' attention, um, and it's also difficult to get uh, a sense that there's meaningful work left to be done. Now, you mentioned, you know, that attention is scarce, and now you're talking about why, you know, all the distractions. Why does it matter that attention is scarce? Uh, well, there, there, there's a school of thought. Uh, Nicholas Carr has written a book uh, called The Shallows that says, uh, that the internet is making us uh, a shallow people, that we, we click on things and we read across the surface. I'm not so convinced by that, uh, but I do think he's diagnosed one of the problems of all of this information proliferation, which is uh, a sense that y you pay attention to what's happening right now and then you move on to what the next thing is. And what we specialize in the academy is in, t is in teaching people to understand things deeply and to embrace a sense of complexity and to develop a higher and higher tolerance for ambiguity. And uh, nothing, none of those attributes or skills becomes available if I can't get your attention. Um, now where are students placing their attention? Where, where would we find their attention? I know you mentioned some things in the past. Where do we see them? Um, well, I, it, one thing that happens, uh, and this is, all changes so quickly just in the, over the course of the life of my kids, the distractions went from TV, you know, you would try and regulate the amount of TV ki kids right. could watch, and then you'd regulate how much time they could play video games, and then suddenly it's, you're, you're regulating, well, not just how much time they spend talking on the cell phone, because talking on the cell phone actually ceases to become the central activity of the cell phone. Right. Um, it becomes texting. And so how many texts do they send out? And now it's Instagram and uh, uh, Flash, uh, what is that called? Flash chat, I can't remember what that's called. Uh, but this Snapchat, this new device for, uh, uh, you can now send images to somebody else with a timer on them and then mm -hmm. they disappear. So all of this is, is to say, you know, there's somebody out there trying to get in touch with you all the time. And then if, you're not, if they're not trying to get in touch with you, you're out on Facebook seeing <laughs> what their updates are. So these things are all very active. They're stimulating. They're exciting. They're responsive. Um, and so it, it's, it's natural that, they, that it would uh, take this kid's attention. Uh, the, the challenge is that education is this unnatural 
process, right? The unnatural mm -hmm. process of demanding your attention and insisting that you pay attention to what you don't know rather than what you like or what you'd like to be doing. We reported on a piece of research a few weeks ago that said that if children can't focus when they're younger, if they have issues as children, then they will have trouble later in life being successful. So that would really would bear some, give some weight to what you're just seeing happening around you. Now you mentioned the value of boredom. You know, we all hate to be bored. Yeah. Um, why is it good to be bored? <laughs> well, it's one of the things, I, it's, a, it's, a, it's a point I make in my talk every time. I say, you know, one of the things we've lost because of this response of technology is the experience of being profoundly bored. And, Some and students I, in my class, I think, have sometimes reached that stage. But that's actually, uh, kids have always been bored in class. <laughs> that's actually a different kind of boredom than, than what I'm talking okay. about. Um, what I'm talking about is uh, being with yourself and finding that you're bored and that that experience says, I could be more. I need to strive to be more interesting, to have deeper thoughts. I need to know more. So to be in class to be bored is to say the teacher isn't entertaining me or the information isn't uh, dressed up mm -hmm. in an exciting fashion. And so you blame your boredom on the external world. The, the kind of boredom I'm talking about is the personal experience of boredom. Um, and that gets lost, and I know this from my own personal experience, if you've got that phone in your hand, you can always be checking yes. something and you can be saying, hey, did you just see what happened in uh, North Carolina, the spill, or uh, you know, West Virginia where the spill was. Um, there's always something else you can be talking about, and so you're never left with a moment trying to think about what, why am I here? You know, I know some people would say, and we've heard them say, because of this access to information, it should be making us more interesting and more interested. I mean, there is so much out there. Why isn't that happening? And what do we see happening in terms of students' interest in things? Yeah, that, that's actually a project my colleague Andrew Resick and I are, are working on most directly, um, is this question of the mystery of motivation, we call it. How, how do you discover that you are interested in something. Um, and so we, we have an assignment where we say to the students, you know, we want you to be interested in something. It can be anything at all. Um, and we've been struck by what a struggle that is for university students uh, to say, oh, I'm interested in this, and, and have what they're interested in be a question or a problem or something that's difficult as opposed to I'm interested in this because I like it. Um, that's fine, mm -hmm. um, but the university is meant to train you to be interested in difficult issues, complex problems. Um, the information overload, I think it, that's one reason why people struggle to be interested because there's too much. You can't mm -hmm. master it. There's no way to understand it. Um, there are other causes as well though. Uh, we live in a time of unprecedented problems. Uh, every major problem that we have now comes with the adjective global. Uh, global economic collapse, mm -hmm. global warming, the global war on terror. And that's n that suggests a magnitude in these problems that's far beyond the reach of any one person, an 18-year-old or a 52-year-old. Mm -hmm. um, the problems now are so big and so complicated that we actually need to be training students to learn how to work together collaboratively on dealing with these complex problems. You mentioned earlier um, Nicholas Carr, and I think um, it was an article or book he wrote, Is Google Making Us Stupid? Yeah, that was the um, article that the book um, is the based article, on. Yeah. Is Google making us stupid? I mean, we think we're so smart. I mean, we know everything. Is yeah. it making us stupid? I, I think the way he asked the question, you have to say, well, yes, it is. And I, don't, I think Google's a tool. And so what we need to do as teachers is to teach students how to use the tool uh, to make them more curious, to make them more inquisitive. Um, and you'd be surprised uh, how, uh, what news it is to students to say, um, you know, if you have a question, like how do I uh, read this kind of graph, you can type that into Google and there will be someone who's going to explain that to you. So you don't just have to use Google to seek out the funniest videos. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so it's, it's really a question of how we're going to teach people to use these tools. And the other issue that I stress is I think it's, we have to rethink what it means to educate because educate, education's focused on the individual and these are tools of collaboration. So how will that affect the role of the teacher? in the classroom? Oh, I, I think the role of the teacher has, uh, has changed in, uh, in profound ways. Uh, the, the need for a different kind of teacher is clear. Um, there's much that we learned that brought us to teaching that mm -hmm. remains the same. Again, that tolerance for ambiguity, um, a sensitivity to nuance and context. Those, those are skills that transfer over. Um, but the this chart that I that I brought with me, if you'd like well, me to speak about talk that about, for yeah, a bit. We'll, we'll get uh -huh. Jim Carney had the opportunity to speak with some students about their distractions. So let's listen to what they have to say and then we'll get back oh, and talk okay. about where they're coming from. Wonderful. Okay? Thanks, Linda. Recently, I gathered together some of my Lehman College students to get their thoughts on digital technology. What was the first digital technology you were exposed to as a little kid? I believe my first experience or first exposure with technology as a kid was the Game Boy. I was about um, seven years old. Took it to school. My teachers took it away from me. Um, after, um, at home, after homework, I played on it. At night, um, some of them even came with, like, with a little like, USB little like, lamp thing so you can plug into the side and then you can play at night because back then it didn't have any backlights. As I remember, my first exposure was, was like a video game called 2600, it was a consola. I guess it was the first video game I, in, 19, in 1987. That was the first time I used to play Batman. That was my favorite game. I got my first cell phone when I was 11. I was very happy. Um, middle school my mom was really worried about me like checking the train by myself so that was the first time that I got a cell phone. I didn't get my first cell phone until high school actually. I was a freshman, 14 years old and it was this um this Sprint Nextel brick flip phone but it it was really cool really cool. My smartphone is like my life I, I, guess, I can't even believe I say this because I've been uh, connected with my smartphone I, 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 I don't sleep without my smartphone. I wake up with my smartphone. I use my smartphone for everything. I use it, I use the calendar, I use it for reminders, I use it to keep up with my blog, information, Twitter, social media, everything. It's my life. It's my phone. I use every single app on it, from the um, agenda for birthday, um, notes, music, Facebook, Skype, I mean, everything. Mm -hmm. Has there ever been a time when you've left the house and you're on the subway or you're in the car and you go to your pockets and you say, oh no, I don't have my cell phone. And, and how does that make you feel? When I don't have my phone, it's immediate panic. Um, I don't take the highway, but I do take the train. And if I've gone far enough that I can't go back, I, like, I won't be late but I'll just know I missed so many calls. It feels like somebody just came into to your world and just ripped you out of it and you're just separated from everyone and everything. I go back for my phone. I don't care if I'm outside my job, I would still go back <laughs> for my phone. One, because my mother would go crazy. Two, because I work from my phone. At the first second, I feel alone. I feel empty, I feel like I left half of me home. But then I get used to it and it's not that terrible. When I got the smartphone, it became addictive. There's something addictive about the phone. You know, when you discover it, you discover how it works and everything is in that little phone, it becomes addictive. When you don't have it, you feel like, like, a, like somebody that's on drug. When I get home, it's to check and see if I had any messages about jobs or school or anything like that or if I hear any friends, especially um, he's gonna kill me with the boyfriend in England. I wanna make sure I keep in touch with him and everything and stuff because sometimes he'll call my phone or he'll Skype me or something like that. How does it affect the way um, that you communicate with your extended family back in Ivory Coast? Um, completely like 
a thousand percent, I would say. Because a few years ago, it was only about phone calls. You know, you had to go to the store, get some cards, and it was hard sometimes, even with the cards. But now, with all those um, video conferences, you know, those messenger apps, we are just in touch every day, every day, and it's pretty easy, easy because, you know, we just have to text each other. I text my mom like four times a day. She calls me or Skype me on weekends. We don't really feel that distance anymore. It is a breakthrough. For me, it's a breakthrough because when I look back at the first immigrant that used to come here from Italy, as you said, Europe mostly, um, it was difficult. They were coming by boat. It wasn't easy at all, you know. The mailman would take months and months to bring back a postcard from America. You know, now the world has become a global village. You know, when I stay two days without communicating with a friend in Cameroon, she, she's mad. She, she, calls, she send me text messages with stickers that say, you know, you dropped me or something like that. You know, she, they expect. Uh, if you don't have your cell phone in the morning when you live in your house, it's like as you're living without clothes. Something like that. And if I'm in the highway and I find that my phone is not with me, I return even though I go late to whatever I'm going. It's just everything. So that's why you relate to my classes. Exactly, okay. sir. <laughs> now, back to Linda and her guest in the studio. You uh, mention a major paradigm shift from the Print-centric, a print-centric paradigm to a network-centric paradigm, which has changed how we communicate. Let's talk about that a little bit. The chart is here for people to see. Okay. What are some of those differences? What do we know about our print-centric world? What was that? Well, I think the way to, to uh, focus on the problem is to say, uh, when we went to school, uh, everything uh, focused on paper. Everything we did focused on the paper that you've written on, and it has your name on it and paper was understood to be the final destination of human thought. And so you would write a paper to your teacher, it would go just to your teacher, mm -hmm. she would grade it and give it back to you. And then the, as that followed up in the training, you would write uh, an article, submit it to a press, you'd wait an extended amount of time, and then it would get revised and get accepted, and it would finally come out to print. And maybe people would read it or not, you wouldn't really be sure. Um, so that relationship between writer and reader, uh, which we assume as distant and that the writer is isolated um, and the writer is master of the content, um, every piece of that equation has been changed by the internet. If you write something now, you can publish it instantly. You don't have to go to a publisher of any kind. You can go to your blog, you can go to your Facebook page, um, or you can have a listserv and send it to all your colleagues who are interested in educational issues. There are lots of venues for instant publication um, that's essentially free. Um, so that's a significant change. Um, but it's not simply the speed and distribution that's different. What I stress, uh, in this chart is that what matters most to us as teachers is actually the last two things on the chart. Um, that when we went to school, uh, what we did was we were trained to be masters of content, right? When we introduced, you know, you're a uh, specialist in education, right. I'm a specialist in education reform, right? And that, you know your information. And that was because information was scarce. You had to go to libraries and you had to go to the teachers who had that knowledge mm -hmm. to learn from them. Now, information's everywhere, as we've been saying. It's super abundant. So, uh, in some sense, when a student comes in and says, oh, I found this interesting thing on the internet, you can say, well, anybody could have found it, right? It's on the internet. Uh, so the, it's no longer a mastery of content that we need to be training students to be. We need to be training them to be uh, masters of resourcefulness. Uh, and that's difficult for them because they have trouble distinguishing, I think, what they see on the internet, what's valuable, what's not valuable, what's legitimate research, what isn't. How do you do that? Uh, it's, it, it's what we have to be doing. In a research class we taught, uh, my colleague and I, uh, we work on this because you have to work on this. It used to be you go to the library, is this a reliable source? Well, right. it's in the library it's a, right, and the library's a bought it. Journal. I right, have it. You know, I, right, so that's mm -hmm. a, you know it. Somebody else is telling you it's real. 
Um, you go to the web, and what do you get? Well, most people just click on the first page of Google, so you get the thing that's most clicked on. That's not necessarily the best source or the richest source or the most interesting source. Um, and then what we discovered quite by accident in our class when we sent our students out for information on um, uh, Mark Rothko, believe it or not. The painter? Uh, the painter, the, yeah. The artist, yeah. Yeah, so they had gone and seen the play Red, oh, right, and we yeah. said we want him to come back and learn about Mark Rothko and create this archive for the class where we worked on it. Um, and one of the students uh, uh, linked everybody into this site, um, and it was very critical of Rothko. Um, and it was only when we went back and looked at it that it was actually, uh, you could see that it was actually a white supremacist site. It looked in every way like uh, a scholarly site. So who figured out that it was a white supremacist site? Did you point it out well, to them? Yes. Were the students able? And so what were the clues that you picked up on that they didn't see? You know, this is, this is the thing about being able to do things so quickly. You say, go get some resources that we're going to share. And a student finds the name. And you can rush by the act of reading and share something without reading it. As soon as we brought it back in and put it up on the screen and said, now let's read this together, the student, you know, I mean, it was immediately obvious. But that's actually part of what we need to be doing now is teaching people how to evaluate every piece of information that comes into them. The first impulse is to go to Wikipedia. Mm -hmm. And um, I think my students, first and foremost, go to Wikipedia. Yeah. Now, I know Wikipedia, in some sense, is an amazing thing. I mean, the fact that it's this thing that everyone contributes to and shares. What are your feelings about things like that, like Wikipedia, which is, in some ways, I guess, a wonderful thing? Uh, what do you think? I love Wikipedia. I think um, it's, it's a point to a, a future we could have, where we collaborate on uh, the production and sharing of knowledge. It's also clearly a battleground. There are people who spend every day messing it up. And, <laughs> and, uh, but, but as a start, as something that shows us um, what we could do if we uh, collect collectively shared what we know, I think is pretty impressive. Um, but what I always tell to my students is, look, that's only the place to start. You know, that, that's not the place you stay. It gets you launched so that you can then go on mm -hmm. and do interesting, thoughtful work. Um, so I think it's a mistake to tell them not to go there, just like it's a mistake to tell them not to go to Spark Notes mm -hmm. or. Uh, oh, yeah, another you know, favorite source. Yes, <laughs> and actually, a, a remarkably good one. I don't understand the business model for Spark Notes because it's so good and free. You know, I don't we get had it. Monarch Notes and Cliff Notes when I was a kid. Yeah, yeah, I no, have to oh, say that. My friend cried over the monarch notes to War and Peace. She said they were beautiful. <laughs> I used to tease her about that to this very day. She said they were touching. I <laughs> love that story. <laughs> it's a true story. But um, so yes, that, that was always there. But somehow, as you said, we knew that that was an abbreviated short yes, version. Yes. We wouldn't even think to crib from it on right, a paper. Right, I mean, right, we wouldn't right. cross our minds. So do you think, I mean, there are some people, and I can't remember, um, I think Clay Shirky, if yeah, I have the name yeah, right. Yeah. He did talk about this idea of um, cognitive surplus. surplus. Yeah. Do you agree with him that it's better to share than to, no matter what it is, than to watch TV? I mean, there's something to the act of creating and sharing. What are your I, thoughts? I, quickly? I, I, I think Clay Shirky's guts, he has, I think, a much clearer sense of the potential, uh, educational potential for the internet. Um, and uh, we're a long way from there because uh, so many people uh, who are thoughtful people from print culture have not made the transition to digital culture so that they can show what thoughtfulness would look like in this new environment. Um, but I, if, I, if you have to choose between uh, him and Nick Carr, I think Clay Shirky's the one educator should embrace. Now, um, in the few minutes we have left, and that's all we have left, I want to ask you, how would you like to see education move forward in these distracting, ill-informed times? Uh, I think we need to shift from uh, a focus on consumption. I mean, it, the funny thing is we've moved completely into an assessment-based model. Students, the students who come to college now are the most tested students in human history. 
and yet the world we live in is one of incredible complexity where the problems don't have immediate visible answers and they don't present themselves as choose between A, B, C, or D. So there's a mismatch right now between our focus on this kind of assessment, let me be able to check what you're doing all the time, and the necessity of creating people who can think creatively and collaboratively. Now that's the shift I think that has to take place. How do you train people to have habits of the creative mind? And will this also refer to their ethical development in some sense as well? It's, a, it's absolutely essential. I mean, that's what got me launched on this project initially, actually, was when this young man from Rutgers committed suicide, Tyler Clemente, right. um, and jumped off the George Washington mm -hmm. Bridge. Uh, his final post to the world, his suicide note, was, was his status on his Facebook page. I found that incredibly poignant and uh, significant for us to think about why you would choose that venue. And then as I explored the case more and saw that when he was being spied on, um, the guy who was spying on him communicated through Twitter that he was doing it and no one told him to stop, I thought, I need to figure out why that is. And the answer to that is much more complicated right. than it seems. Well, maybe we can have you back to talk about that uh, again. I'd love to. Our time is up. So wow. I want to thank you so much for joining us today and sharing these really important ideas with us. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thanks for having me. Sure. Thank you. Don't go away. We'll be right back with our Ed Bites. <music> Welcome back to this edition of Ed Bites. Are you smarter than a fifth grader? Maybe not if you're a college athlete. CNN reports that many football and basketball players at major athletics universities may not be literate above a fifth grade level. The network requested SAT and ACT scores of athletes on public university teams with open records. Of those universities that provided information, between 7 and 18 percent of football and basketball players were, quote, reading at an elementary school level, end quote. Universities explained some athletes don't take the test seriously, aiming only to do well enough to meet National Collegiate Athletic Association minimum requirements. Yeah, unfortunately, I've noticed that with some of the athletes in some of the courses that I've taught. They have to be occasionally reminded to wake up in class. <laughs> The underrepresentation of females, blacks, and Hispanics in the higher paying STEM fields starts early. Edwig reports that according to College Board data, no African American students took the high school computer science AP exam in 11 states, and no Hispanic took it in 8 states. In Mississippi and Montana, not one female, African American, or black student took the exam. While nationwide 30,000 students took the AP computer science exam, Less than 20% were female, about 3% were African American, and 8% were Hispanic. The College Board observed that white male students historically dominate computer science courses. Mm -hmm. one, of, one note on the previous, uh, Ed Bite, the fact that uh, I think girls don't play video games at a young age plays into their not wanting to get into computer sciences. And that's because some of the video games are very boy oriented right. and we should really do an edcast about video games because right. there really is important to get girls involved in them. Mm -hmm. okay. So girls, pick up those, uh, <laughs> those games. Well that does it for this edition of EdCast. Until next time, class dismissed. Okay.